Brother Paul's text would be Peter first three fifteen. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you you all reason you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now I'll pray for Brother Paul. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, Lord. I pray that Brother Paul will have a good sermon text, Lord. And I pray that everybody returns to him, Lord, and learn something, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for that. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Now, I can tell you from personal experience that this is good to think about. So I would recommend you, you tune up your minds and, and, and think, think on what is said by this scripture. I think there's a lot more to it than, than you might first see. You, you can kind of read over this in the middle of, the, middle of the, the passage. But sanctifying the Lord God in your hearts is something that's really blessed me over the last few weeks, and I hope you can get a taste of that too. Now this is a little different aspect than we're going to be looking at most of this week. When we're thinking about sanctifying, we're thinking about being sanctified by God. But in this verse, it says that we are sanctifying God. It's a little different aspect, and, and, but it's worthy of our consideration. Now my main point, if, if you don't remember anything else, I want you to remember this, this point. This is what I hope to develop. Is, when, is that when we sanctify God in our hearts, we stop focusing on our own problems, and we are prepared to testify of God's greatness. And you'll see as, as I go through this. When we sanctify God in our hearts, we stop focusing on our problems, and we, we're prepared to testify of, of God's greatness, of who he is. But before we go on, we have to define what it means to sanctify the Lord in our hearts. When we think of sanctification, we think of being made holy. We think of having any sin in our lives being purged out, being made more like God. But when you think about sanctifying God, well, God doesn't need that. God doesn't need to be made more like God. God doesn't need to be made more holy. God doesn't have any sin to be purged out of his life. So this is a different, different aspect that we're looking at here. So first of all, define what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that we make God holy. Let's get that, let's get that out of the way right here. And I've got a couple examples that I think demonstrate what we're doing here. The Sabbath day... In Genesis 2, 3, it says that God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Okay, so God set apart this day. And then he tells his people, he says, Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. He also told them, I am the Lord your God, walk in my statutes, and keep my judgments, and do them, and hallow my Sabbaths. They shall be a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. God tells his people to sanctify his Sabbaths. He tells his people to hallow, which is kind of synonymous with sanctifying, to hallow his Sabbaths. But the, we read from Genesis that God already did that. God already sanctified his Sabbaths. So then, when, when they kept the Sabbath, were they, were they actually making it holy? No, they were not, because God already did that. God already made it holy. And when they sanctified it, when they hallowed it, they acknowledged its holiness, and they treated the Sabbath with the proper regard. Another example is the Mount Sinai. Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for thou chargest us, saying, Set bounds about the mount and sanctify it. 
So did the people make the mountain holy and special by putting these fences around it? No, what made the, the mountain special was God's presence. The mountain was holy already. It was set apart already. But when the people sanctified it, it means that they acknowledged and they reverenced the, the, the fact that God was there and that he had sanctified it. They gave it the proper fear. So the point here is that the Lord's person is not in any way changed when we sanctify him in our hearts. It's not that we are somehow improving upon the Lord's character, but instead it's our understanding of and our reverence for his person that is enhanced when we sanctify the Lord in our hearts. What does sanctification mean? Sanctification means setting apart. Setting apart is holy. So when we sanctify the Lord in our hearts, in our hearts we, we reverence him as being holy, as being the righteous and perfect and great God that he is. Sanctifying the Lord is acknowledging his glory. In Leviticus 10, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. So Nadab and Abihu didn't think it mattered very much how they came to God. And by implication, this means that they didn't think that God was very holy. They didn't think that it, it, was, it was such a, such, a, such a big thing to come before God because he, they didn't think he was that holy. Well, what God says is that they didn't sanctify him. In their hearts, they did not set apart God as any different from the ordinary, as anything that required special preparations to come before him, or doing it the way he commanded. And God said, they didn't sanctify me. He also said, neither shall ye profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. So he contrasts profaning with hallowing, or sanctifying, Profaning God's name is speaking or acting in a way that shows contempt for him. It's, it's like casting his name aside in the dirt. But sanctifying his name is like lifting his name up and holding it in the highest regard in your hearts. This is what it means to sanctify the Lord. God said in Isaiah 8, Say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy. Neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. When we sanctify the Lord, we have him as our fear. We regard him as the ultimate power, the one with, with, with all authority and greatness. So we, we set him apart as the one that we fear, the single, the single most important in the world and in our hearts. <clears throat> now we set, apart him, set him apart as, as one that we fear, and that's what these examples have been re describing so far. But there's more than that. We also set him apart as first, and most preferred in our hearts. God said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So he, God is to be in a realm where nothing or no one else is. God is to be of, of utmost importance in our heart. And anything we, we let in, we let into that holy place, we, we, have, just, we have just pushed God off the throne, so to speak. So sanctifying God means you put him as your only love. Jesus said the first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. 
God must be first in our love, our thoughts, and our actions. He has to be number one. This is what it means to sanctify the Lord in your hearts. He's number one in everything. So sanctifying the Lord is fearing him above all else. It's loving him above all else. You know what else it is? Sanctifying the Lord is a command. I just want to point this out, that, that this verse is a command to us. We are told to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. That tells me that this isn't something that just happens. This isn't something that you wake up and you realize, wow, I sanctified the Lord in my heart. No, this is something that you choose to do, and it takes effort. But it is, it is very much worth it because he is worthy of being number one. Now, I'd like to go back to the text and read a little bit of context here. 1 Peter 3, starting at verse 13, says, Who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear. So this phrase, sanctify the Lord in your hearts, wasn't just put in a vacuum. It's put in the context of suffering, actually. It, he says, if you suffer for Christ, then he said, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And when I say it's a command to sanctify the Lord, it may be easy to do when things are, when things are going smoothly. But, but when, when you're in suffering, the, the real heart is revealed in it. And so let's look at this in the context of, of affliction. He gave us two instructions. He says, don't be afraid of their terror and don't be troubled. Now sanctifying God is the alternative to both of those. It's, it's the answer to both of these traps that you can fall into when you're suffering. When he says, be not afraid of their terror, well, when you have sanctified the Lord in your heart, you know that the Lord is greater than any evil power you can face. When you have see God as, as truly great and, and holy as he is, then, then anything coming against you is nothing in comparison to God. <clears throat> Sanctifying God is the answer to terror of, of wicked men. Now the high priest asked the apostles, saying, Did we not straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. So what happened there? Well, the apostles had sanctified the Lord God in their hearts, and they recognized that the Lord's authority was above any man's. And they wouldn't be scared into backing down. Because they knew that God was king. God was in charge. And, and, and they weren't going to fear the high priest. <clears throat> we know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When they were brought before Nebuchadnezzar, they said, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Now who was Nebuchadnezzar? He was the, the most powerful king in the world at this time. He was the head of gold. And why weren't they afraid to speak to him? Not only just uh, have an audience with him, yet, but Nebuchadnezzar at this time was threatening to kill them, to throw them into a burning furnace of fire. Why weren't they afraid? Because they knew their God. 
See, what they said is our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us. What did they do? They sanctified the Lord in their hearts, and they weren't afraid of the terror of wicked men. Now, the second admonition in suffering was not to be troubled. You know, sometimes when you're suffering, your, your flesh wonders, why is this happening? What's going on here? Is God in control? You get agitated. <clears throat> this is the tendency of the flesh. But when we sanctify the Lord, we recognize that he is in total control of the situation. And we don't have to worry. Jesus said, when ye pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So that's sanctifying the Lord. Your name is holy. Lift it up above all else. Then he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. So true hallowing of God's name brings about calm and complete surrender to his will. If you're going to say, hallowed be your name, you better be willing to accept whatever his will is. And there's the peace in knowing that God's will, God's will is perfect. Let it be done, even if it means suffering for, for us. Psalm 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. There's suffering. You know what comes next? He says, but thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Now David, even in suffering, he recognized that God was holy. <clears throat> in suffering, the hu we humans tend to ask why. We, we wonder if God's not strong enough to save us from this or if, if he's unjustly letting us go through this. No, that's not the case at all because he is holy. And David recognized that and Jesus also recognized that. He sanctified the Lord and he put his will above his own. So he tells us not to be troubled. Don't be worried about what's going on because you know the Lord is in control. Sanctify the Lord. <clears throat> so we got the what. We got what it is to sanctify the Lord and we got the context. It's any time but particularly in suffering. But here's, here's the main point. This is what the results are of sanctifying the Lord. And I've got several examples showing results of people who sanctified the Lord in their hearts. Result one is that we can have peace in trouble. And we don't have to be worried. <clears throat> see, when we see how great God is, it means that we can let him work and not think that we have to take care of everything ourselves. It means we can trust and rely upon the Lord. Now, in 2 Kings 6, the king of Syria heard that Elisha was giving away all his battle plans. And so he figured he would solve that. And here he heard uh, that Elisha was in Dothan. And it says, therefore, he sent thither horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. So there was the protection of the Lord. Now, I want to point out here that the servant's problem was not an inaccurate view of the Syrian army, but instead it was an inaccurate view of God. And so when Elisha pointed him to the Lord and said, well, look at how glorious, how perfect, and how, how powerful the Lord is, then the servant didn't need to worry about the Syrian army. <clears throat> Elisha didn't deny that there were many people against them, but he knew that the Lord's army was greater. 
So when we sanctify the Lord God in our hearts, it actually takes our mind off the, the things of this world and it puts, it puts our mind on God and puts on our mind on his glory and his power. And boy, that gets rid of a lot of, a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry, and it lets us trust in him. When the armies from Moab, Ammon, and Seir came against King Jehoshaphat, there was a prophet who said to them, Hearken ye, all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. See, this is turning it over to God. Let, let him handle it. <clears throat> And so when they actually got to the battlefield, here's what happened. As they rose up early in the morning and went forth in the, into the wilderness of Tekoa, and as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Israel, and ye inhabitants of the Jerusalem. Believe the Lord, of God, the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. And when he consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army, and to say, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord sent ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. So what did they do? They, they decided that instead of fighting, they would praise the Lord. They would send out the singers before the army. This wasn't their backup plan. The singers went out first in front of everybody, and they praised the Lord. Well, what's that? That's sanctifying the Lord. That's saying he is holy. He's beautiful. And what happened? Their enemies melted away before them. See, when they let God handle it, when they had a high view of God, well, the things on this earth really didn't phase them anymore. They went out with boldness, and the Lord gave them victory. <clears throat> so when we sanctify the Lord, it brings about a peace, a peace in knowing that he is great and perfect. And then we go back to 1 Peter 3.15 again and see when he says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, right after he says, And... Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So when we sanctify the Lord in our hearts, it prepares us, it prepares ourselves to give an answer to those people who would ask us. It prepares us to testify to others about God's greatness. Because it means that we see God's greatness already in ourselves. See, if you can't see the glory of God yourself, how can you show it to anyone else? How can you testify of it? But on the other hand, if you have seen God's glory, how can you but show it to those around you? When we have a view of God as, as, as great as he is, well, that's going to that's gonna spill over to the people around us. We're going to testify of his greatness. And the woman at the well, I'm going to pick up at the, toward the end of this account. She says to Jesus, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came his disciples, and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot, and went her way into the city, and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. Now, when, she, when this woman thought that Jesus was a Jew... She thought that, she, that he was talking to the wrong person. And then when she thought he was a water salesman, she misunderstood what he was offering. When she thought he was a prophet, she asked him a religious question. But when she saw that he was the Messiah, the only Son of God, 
her heart was changed and she testified to everyone in the city of the living hope she had found. See, what mattered is where she saw Jesus. When Jesus was finally sanctified in her heart as the Messiah, the Son of God, well, it made her go out and tell. <clears throat> Let's go back to uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We hear the conclusion of the story where God protected them in the burning furnace. It says, Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted him, and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. So what happened? What happened was that God was glorified by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego having this, this high view of him, sanctifying him in their heart. God was glorified before this pagan king. So what they did in their hearts didn't just affect them. And when you sanctify God in your hearts, it not, it's not just going to affect you either. It's going to affect the people in the world you're around, and it's going to affect the brethren you're around. Because you see who God really is, and it shows. <clears throat> now, in another encounter between the, the apostles and the high priests and elders... I want you to, to listen to this and think, how did Peter view Jesus? Acts 4, 7. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of Israel and elders of, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel but that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved." Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. So how did Peter see Jesus? Peter saw Jesus as the head of the corner, as the one who rose from the dead. He saw him as the one who had power and authority. And this view of Jesus made him unafraid of suffering and what men could do to him. Because they, he saw Jesus as, as ultimate, the only king. And, and what happened is that he boldly testified of Jesus. And the people marveled at the work that God had done in this ignorant and unschooled person. When, Jesus, or when Peter sanctified Jesus in his heart, when, Jesus, when Peter saw Jesus as his king, it not only made him unafraid of suffering, it also testified to the chief priests and the elders and everyone around of God's power and glory. So I encourage you that, especially even in this, this very week, as we think about sanctification, sanctify the Lord in your heart. It's sanctification is not just for you. It's for sanctifying the Lord. And see, see the glory of God, and it makes, it makes a difference, and it shows to the world, and it shows to, to everyone who's looking on. Thank you.